have 28 people so far. So we're going to go ahead and get started at the 6.30 hour so that um, everyone could go back to their regular lives. Um, okay. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to Community Board's three um, full board meeting for August 2020. Thank you, everyone, for attending this rare meeting. We don't normally meet in August, and so here we are in the middle of August <laughs> or towards the end of August having a Zoom meeting in the middle of a pandemic. <sighs> yep. Okay, so we're going to enter into our public session, but before we do that, I've asked Michael to explain the Zoom rules. Thank you, Michael. Sure. Um, so as always, um, if you are a member of the public, uh, not a board member, if you can just type your name and any affiliation into the chat box, that's the way we've been taking attendance uh, for our board meetings. Um, the meeting is being recorded, um, so please keep that in mind. And also the chat box is um, right now set to only come to myself and the two other co-hosts of the meeting. So other than attendance, the only thing we're using the chat box for is if somebody is having some technical issues with Zoom, um, you can reach out to us in the chat box. And um, Clint, who I don't think is on yet, is the host that will be monitoring the chat box um, for technical issues. But until Clint joins us, myself and Linda will uh, help people out if anyone's having um, issues. Members of the board, just a reminder, if you um, have a question or a comment after a report, um, use the raise hands feature, open the participants tab to raise your hand. Um, and then Alicia will call on people uh, as she sees fit. Um, and you have the power to mute and unmute yourself. So unless you leave your mic open by accident, um, Linda and I will not be muting and unmuting you. You should be muting and unmuting yourself when you want to talk. I think that covers everything, Alicia. Thank you, Michael. Okay, so we're going to enter into our public session, which everyone has two minutes to speak. Um, and as long as we're still on Zoom, all speaker forms have to be submitted on Monday before full board at noon. Please respect the two minute mic time. Um, and so the first person that is, is Garrett, Allringer here, Allringer, Garrett, he will be speaking um, about an agenda item, uh, transportation number two. Hold on one second. I didn't know that name. I'll move him over. I only thought we had a couple of other ones. So I'm promoting him to panelists now, so he'll be able to speak. Garrett and Alex. Harry needs to be moved over also, Michael. Hi, this is Garrett Oringer. I don't know if you guys can hear me, just making sure. Yes, Garrett, we can hear you. All right, awesome, thank you. Just wanna make sure. Okay. You wanna go ahead and start your testimony, Garrett? Yes, please, go ahead, Garrett. Sure, sure. Can you just one second, I just wanna fix my screen. Thank you again, uh, community members, for letting me speak. Um, so just to give some background, my name is Garrett Oringer. Thank you again for giving me the time to speak. I'm a resident between Broom Street and, um, excuse me, I'm a resident between Orchard Street, between Broom Street and Grand Street. And I wanted to speak to you today in proposal to close Broom Street between Allen and Orchard to traffic, which I know is considered item number two during this month's transportation committee meeting. Broom Street for me is a natural place to add a pedestrian plaza. And especially during COVID, it has been a huge relief personally for me to feel free walking, running and biking these streets especially without the danger of vehicular traffic, which honestly is few and far in between. I know we have this setup starting at noon every day and going until 11 at night on the weekends. So making this permanent would be a natural choice given its success so far. Obviously the Orchard Street Pedestrian Mall has long been a part of this area since before I was honestly born. So this feels like a natural progression too. And given that this block is full of restaurants and bars, many of which have unfortunately had to shutter their doors in the past few months, gives them an area extra space where people can actually hang out, not in front of congested streets on Orchard, and give them a true place to have a pedestrian plaza. So I personally hope that the board considers the neighborhood lacks nearby green by space and gives us the chance to have more room to stretch our legs and honestly enjoy our local community more than we already do. Thank you again for the time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next we have, speaking for transportation number two, um, 
Alex Baker. Hold on. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, hold on one second, Alex. I'm trying to promote you to panelists, but your name kept moving around. There you go. Terrific. Um, I assume folks can hear? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Well, look, I, I, will, I will be very quick. I, uh, I echo some of the comments. The neighborhood that we live in is great, and I feel really fortunate that there are people like you thinking about how to improve it every day. So I, uh, I, I first of all, thank you all for, for doing this. Um, it is, uh, I, I, I think it's just, it, it is such a, would be such a monumental improvement to keep the streets open, to create the space, to limit the just absurd traffic problem that has really started to occur or continues to occur in, in a number of these corners. It, either one of those reasons would be enough to do it, given the economic issues that a lot of these businesses are facing without outdoor space, the benefits that come from just enjoying our neighborhood more and having you know a, a more space to do so, and then the traffic concerns that are quite frankly unsafe um, and and you know I'm uh, unsafe and uncomfortable. And so for that, I'm very supportive of keeping the streets open and just wanted to make that, make that known and hope it's considered. Okay, so thank, thank you, Alex. Um, next we have Harry Bubbins, Greenwich Village. Great, can you hear me? Yes. Great, well, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm Harry Bubbins. I am testifying on behalf of Village Preservation, uh, formerly the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, the largest membership organization in Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo. And this is testimony in support of the Landmarks Committee resolution regarding the ongoing and worsening hazardous emergency conditions at 605 East 9th Street off of Avenue B, uh, Aka Old PS64, Charisel Bohio. Uh, we're very grateful the Landmarks Committee met on this emergency matter upon the request of our organization and our partners at East Village Community Coalition and Lower East Side Preservation Initiative. Uh, as many of you know, there is an open vacate order on the property, uh, in addition to a Landmarks Preservation Chair's order to repair, and tens of thousands of dollars in fines for open violations dating back to at least 2017. As the committee was made aware of and saw photographic evidence, there have been people accessing the roof uh, sometimes with a pickaxe. This is a potentially dangerous situation and it continues today with people accessing the building regularly and seen on the roof and throughout the building. Uh, despite these uh, city agency orders to repair, there's no evidence on publicly accessible records that any permits have been filed or obtained by the current owner to complete any of the work necessary to make the building safe and secure, thereby protecting the property uh, from further damage. Uh, Community Board 3, as you know, suffered a terrible loss when the vacant landmark Beth Hamadrash Hagadog Synagogue burnt down. Uh, we don't want that same situation to happen here with this landmark that is potentially undergoing demolition by neglect. Uh, in that regard, we support the, the uh, resolution's uh, uh, action items or requests that the New York City Department of Buildings must properly secure the building and make emergency repairs and build the owner as they have the authority to do. The Landmarks Preservation Commission must take legal action to prevent demolition by neglect uh, and compel repairs and issue the maximum fines. And of course, as my time goes up, we want to remind the mayor of his promise to return the building to community use. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harry. Next, we have Tom B. Loeb. Hello. Thank you. Um, I, I want to first update the board on the community lawsuit on alienation. Last week, we were heard in state Supreme Court. The judge ruled against us in the uh, early uh, decision based on the fact that the city submitted testimony that the park would flood, East River Park would flood twice daily in the year 2100, 80 years from now. Uh, she failed to address the current issue uh, which we brought before her. Um, we are appealing this decision because the city submitted information that was false, basically, and uh, 
uh, based on studies that were specifically said that they should make, not be used for planning or for legal purposes. So we're appealing that decision. What I'm really here to discuss is, as you know, when EC, ESCR was approved, um, they formed a community advisory group. And that group has now met. And the issue before the group is whether or not the public will be allowed to attend those meetings. CB3 is an official member of that CAG. And there is a vote, which is supposed to be uh, submitted by September 1st. And I'm wondering how CB3 is going to handle its uh, official membership of the CAG. It has a uh, a, a member uh, has a, a designated member of the CAG, but I don't know that that member has been instructed on how to vote. And there are several items up for a vote, including whether or not the CAG should be open to the public. And I'd be interested in knowing how the community board is going to instruct its official member of the CAG how to vote and how the community board will be handling in the future uh, its membership on the CAG, since we're unclear as to how the voting will will affect the, the CAG in the future. So I'd like to know how the CAG is going to be addressed by the community board. Thank you. Okay, next we have Michael, you're speaking. Yes, I am. Hold on a second. Let me time myself. Um, so I am speaking on behalf of my organization, Friends of Corvairs Hook Park. Um, we are finally trying to do events back in the park again. And our first event is going to be a vigil um, for the community to gather and remember those lost by the COVID-19 pandemic. It's going to be September 14th at 6.30 p.m. Um, so far we have um, Rabbi Joanna Samuels from the Manning Cancer Center. Um, on board to make some comments and say some prayers, as well as Father Thomas from the Our Lady of Sorrows Church um, is going to be joining us. Um, we are actively looking for other local clergy to join us. So if anybody has suggestions, please uh, email them my way. And um, again, the vigil will be on September 14th, uh, 6.30 p.m. on Monday. Thank you, Michael. Are you going to post that on this? Uh, I don't know. It's personal, so I don't know if you're going to post it on the social media. I, mean, I think maybe yeah. you could. Yeah. Not our social media, no. That's only about uh, community board okay. events. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, next, we have Miss Olympia Kaza. Kazi, sorry. Got you. Thank you. Don't worry. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm speaking tonight as a local public school parent and um, uh, as Many of the other parents in the district uh, uh, have been following the shameful way in which uh, they have been cutting the budget again and again for public education. Right now, they just announced the reopening plans for New York City, and they are unsafe because they're under-resourced. They're putting a huge strain on teachers and staff. And uh, if teachers and staff aren't safe, everybody isn't safe. The children are unsafe, the families are unsafe, all of New York is unsafe. Uh, unfortunately, the narrative in the media has been depicting us parents as the people who are pushing to reopen schools. And we don't, reop we don't want to reopen schools unless they're truly safe. And so parents from District 1 and District 2 have sewed up strongly last week at the Panel for Education meeting. We stayed up until 3.30 a.m. and we articulated this position. And we need more resources for the schools to reopen safely. So uh, my kid goes to uh, EVCS and uh, there is a social action committee there that is called social action at EVCSNYC.org. I'm posting in the chat the email. We offer to coordinate all the parents who want to organize. We're working with many schools from District 1 and District 2. This is an appeal for parents. So any one of you whose parent who's interested in participating or if you have friends who uh, are from different schools, because we need the schools to reopen, especially families that, you know, cannot work remotely. Uh, everybody needs childcare, I can assure you, but needs to be safe. And so we're working on this issue and our voices need to be heard. 
So uh, if any parent is interested, please email that email and we'll uh, help you get organized and get connected. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Olympia. Uh, next we have May Lee, who's gonna to speak to us about the census as a community board three rep to the Manhattan Borough President's Task Force on the Census. Go ahead, May. Oh, hi, good e evening, everyone. Um, so I just, okay, so I just wanted to remind everyone about the census. Um, first of all, I know there are many community organizations that have been actively, tirelessly uh, doing outreach on the census. And I wanted to thank them for that. However, many people in our CB3 area still haven't completed the census. In some census tracts, we have about as much as 75% complete. That means there's another 25% who haven't answered. In some census tracts, it's like less than 50%. So that means there's more than half of the people in those tracts who haven't answered the census. So CB3 urges everyone to complete the census so this once in every 10 year population count is actually ending pretty soon on September 30th. Um, so we have 36 days left. Uh, you can go to the, the link, uh, the Census uh, um, Bureau link and do it yourself online, or you can call a toll free number and then somebody talks to you and you, you know, give them the, and they, you, it's a question answer thing. You talk to them about it, uh, you know, it's a, uh, person a uh, phone um, interview. Okay, the uh, link is on our website. We will have more information on it on our Facebook page. I also wanted to make everyone aware that, and maybe you've seen this already, there are sent the census takers from the Bureau um, are already out knocking on the doors of the people who haven't answered the census. However, if you haven't answered the census and uh, you can still do it on the website, it's not too late for that. Um, if you Okay, and you go, again, you go to the website. So if you've already done this, I want to urge everyone to tell five of your friends or your family members or your neighbors about this, to answer the census, um, to if there's a census taker that comes to your door, you know, to let them in. We will have more information on our Facebook page um, with information about the census takers and what to expect of them. And finally, um, so watch, uh, so watch out, uh, look at our Facebook page for all this information. Okay, thank you. Alicia, you're muted. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you everyone for uh, your contribution to the public session. And um, again, as a reminder, if you wish to speak at full board Zoom, uh, you have to submit your speaker form 12 noon, the Monday before our full board. Um, okay, so that concludes that. Now we're going to enter into our elected officials report. And I see we have a few elected officials that are joining us tonight. I see our, let's see, I see Deborah, I see Carolyn. Okay, I see Carolyn, uh, Con Congresswoman Carolyn Malone. Would you Thank like you to- Thank you so much, uh, Alicia, for allowing me to speak and having a board meeting uh, now in August so we can continue our work. I just got back from Washington and being on Zoom allows us to speak. First, I wanna, I wanna underscore what May Lee was saying. Uh, we have a disaster now on the census. Uh, the, the, uh, the administration, the Trump administration has unilaterally come in and clipped off four weeks of what we call the door-to-door -door enumeration. So therefore, the hard-to-count communities are gonna be undercounted. I did a report earlier that showed for each person who is not counted, our school system loses roughly $2,700 per student that we would get the money for. Put that over uh, 10 years. So this is a 10-year thing it's an emergency. I'm having a hearing on it. When we get back, they have put on all these political appointees. Uh, I know my friend Deborah Glick will be upset about this in what is supposed to be a nonpartisan civic duty. So I want to join her in saying it's an emergency. If you're, if you're not counted, you're not represented, and our neighborhood will lose millions of dollars 
uh, that for our schools, for our hospitals, for our transportation. I, I want to work with the gentleman, I think it was Harry Bobbins, on the building 605 Ninth Street that he said that they're trying to demolish by neglect. I want to join him and the community. Uh, please reach out uh, to Shelby Garner or Adrian Lesser in my office and get the material. We'll do a letter. I'll make a phone call. I'll join you pushing on that. And then Yep, there you go. You muted yourself somehow. Go ahead. Okay. Very, very briefly, uh, I, I just got back from Washington. The House had a very unprecedented thing. They called people in to vote in uh, August, called us back in uh, because the administration is disrupting the Postal Service, which is going to disrupt a vote by mail. And uh, we passed my bill, which funded it at $25 billion which is what the professionals at the Census Bureau, CBO, everybody says is the needed funding, and also reverses the very harmful actions. Actually, there's an article in the New York Times today about it, and I'll just Google it, it's all over the place. My time's up, my two minutes are already up. So I, I'm <laughs> gonna yield back and uh, listen to what's happening in the community, thank you. But uh, thank you. the postal thing is important, and uh, I, if you know any stories about how they're abusing services in your neighborhood, mm -hmm. please contact me. It's up on our website. Uh, we're, we're going after them. And I'm introducing legislation mm -hmm. today or tomorrow, making the position nonpartisan. Right now, it's two partisan hacks. I'm mega donors to Trump. I'm, I'm, my time's up. I'm sorry. Bye-bye. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. We know how busy you are. Alicia, can I just say one thing before you go to the next elected report, please? Yes. Um, if you are a representative of an elected and you're not a name that's normally on our agenda, if you can just raise your hand or type your name in the chat to let me know. I, I, I see a couple of hands in the attendee list, but they're not names that I know. Um, so if you can just type a message to the chat, let me know who you're repping, and then I'll move you over. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And now we have Assemblywoman Deborah Glick. Thanks. Um, happy to be here with you. Uh, can't wait till we are actually somewhere together physically. Uh, it's, it's getting old. Um, uh, but I just want to remind people that uh, aside from the post office and its implications for the election, there will be early voting. Uh, and those people who can uh, and feel comfortable going out to vote in person should do so. We're gonna put out something that will delineate for people information about that, as well as uh, there, there's supposed to be an opportunity to be able to drop off an absentee ballot should you so uh, choose to get an absentee ballot, do it now. And then uh, we're asking uh, the Board of Elections to have a separate line for people who just want to drop off their absentee ballot, who are concerned about uh, the mail, but want to, uh, don't want to stand on a line in order to vote. So we're going to be asking them to do that. And also, there are people who may have household members um, for whom they want to bring a ballot. There is some uh, one is going to need some sort of uh, form or identification in order to do that. So we're talking to the Board of Elections and we will get that information out to everybody within the next week uh, so that people will have all the information they know about the variety of ways in which they can vote. And if you send in your mail early, uh, chances are you're not going to be disenfranchised. But people have had their ballots disqualified because they haven't really read the instructions very carefully. Uh, so uh, this is vital. Um, frankly, we always say this is the most consequential election, but I think uh, President Obama uh, made it clear last week how vital it is in this circumstance, creeping fascism, uh, for all of the yelling about uh, socialism, uh, you know, they attacked, uh, the GOP attacked uh, unemployment insurance, 
Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid as being socialism. Uh, and all of those folks who are happily uh, taking their Social Security uh, and yet railing against socialism uh, don't really grasp the idea <laughs> that uh, the safety net for everybody uh, is an essence of, um, of that notion. So uh, we are pleased that there has been a little bit of a slowdown in the unemployment request on the one hand. On the other, it just means that a lot of people have run out of their unemployment. And we have a lot of people who are in desperate need. If you have folks uh, that you know who are having uh, problems around housing um, or food insecurity, please have them call the office. We want to help people. We want to connect them to services that are available. And I thank you so much for all of the work you all do. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here. And this was like a Federal Express uh, commercial. I talked as fast as I could. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate all of you all the time. Thank you so much. We appreciate you as well. Are there any other elected officials, Michael? Anyone have any questions for any of our elected officials? Any board members have any questions? Do you see any hands? I don't see any hands. <laughs> Sorry, Alicia, I was having some technical difficulties. Um, no, there's no hands. Um, I can't raise my hand, but I have a question. Oh, Linda raised her physical uh, hand. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. So it's a little flaw in the system. Uh, Deborah, um, you spoke about absentee ballots, and you know I have a college degree, and I voted absentee last time. And those instructions are so small print, detailed, obscure. I try to follow them. I think I did it right, but it seems to me that. Uh, somebody either officially could simplify those instructions and make them user friendly, or we could do something unofficially to make sure everybody gets a simplified explanation as to how to use an absentee ballot. Um, I agree with you. They have said that they are tweaking it. Mm -hmm. An awful lot of people called me personally to ask me about that. I'm, I'm following it on my phone. Oh, you have uh, it on the phone. That was really for the Board of Election officials. Uh, but people were like, uh, I don't know, am I supposed to do something with that? Um, so I, th they have said that they are going to be clearer, um, but I will be talking to them. And again, what we put out will include uh, clarification of what you can and cannot do, what you should and should not do. Even stray marks are a problem. Uh, that's the hanging chad of uh, 2020. So um, I hear you, Linda, and we, we will include uh, clarification. Uh, and obviously, we hope that they will be a little more uh, explanatory in their, um, their printed uh, version. OK. Um, I understand that. Uh, are there any other questions at this time? Anyone else? No. Okay, so we're going to go back down the line of our elected official report. Uh, I, I understand that our borough president, uh, Gail Brewer, will be coming soon. Um, That's the intention, yes. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, okay, so we're just going to go back down the line then. Okay, uh, anyone from the mayor's office? No one. Okay, uh, anyone from the public advocate's office? Okay, no one. Anyone from the comptroller's office? Scott Stringer. Luke is here. Hi. Hi, Luke. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Luke Wolf. I'm from uh, City Comptroller Scott Stringer's office. Um, Nice to see you all. So right now, our office is really focusing on two uh, big buckets. The first is, of course, schools and how that's going to look in the coming weeks. And the second is small business. And that's what I'm going to focus on with my few minutes here. 
Um, so two weeks ago, we released our Save Main Street initiative, which is our report focused on 25 concrete suggestions. Uh, to save Main Street small businesses. And we know uh, across CB3, there have been so many businesses who have been struggling uh, to make their way through the pandemic. So we came up with 25 recommendations to help them. And those are spread across three big buckets. So I'm gonna go through some of those initially, um, and then I'll put the link in the chat for you all to explore more. And I do wanna thank uh, CB3's Economic Development Committee for their work on this and uh, definitely inspiring some of our ideas and uh, pushing our thinking based on all your experience. Um, so the first is about supporting the struggling businesses right now. So some of the ideas there are about tax credits to cover reopening, uh, creating a New York City tech core to help some of these businesses, which were not previously online, move an online presence, which is now more important than ever, or something like a cure period. So as they have violations or little fixes they need to make, they don't get fined by the city, but instead of a period where they can actually make those fixes before they have any uh, economic damages assessed. The second is on how can we support entrepreneurs across the city. Um, so things like if you're in a high vacancy area, which CB3 I think has some of, um, we're gonna give you a tax incentive if you're gonna start a new business there. Or something like what other cities across the country are doing is that if you're a minority business, we wanna put you in an accelerator program to make sure that your business can grow even faster um, and has all the tools they need to be successful. And the third bucket of information is around building stronger neighborhoods. So we've seen the success of the restaurant program. How can we expand that to retail and some other types of uh, small businesses to make sure that they can survive the pandemic, um, but also be creative with a vacant space. So if there is a vacant space, how can we return that space to the community um, to make sure that uh, we're maximizing all the space we have across the city um, so we can be as prosperous in our neighborhoods as we can. So there's just some of the recommendations that we have um, and like I said, I'll drop the link in the chat now and happy to answer any questions on that or anything else we're working on. Any hands, Michael? Olympia. Olympia. Thank you. I mean, I just want to make sure uh, I haven't had a chance yet to read the full report, but mm -hmm. the elephant in the room is rent, right? All the yeah. small businesses are struggling because revenue has been zero and the rent is running and nothing nothing has been done to address commercial rent. Even the eviction moratorium doesn't actually apply on them. So I wanna make sure that if you haven't included something substantial around the rent issue, please do. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's something that we're hearing every day from businesses across the city. And um, like I think our, our state and federal colleagues can speak to as well. There's obviously a need for substantial um, support to make sure that uh, all those businesses can actually stay in their stores, um, which is totally what we want. Um, so we, we do think there's 100% needs to be rent relief. These are focused on even the absence of a massive uh, flow of money, other concrete things we can do. Um, of course, that's something that we need, but we're looking at in addition to that, here are some other concrete things the city or state can do to make sure we're helping our businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. I'm sorry, I have a question. I don't know how to raise my hand. I've been trying to find it. Can I ask a question? Sure, Josie, sure. just for your information and everybody else's, if you open the participant the window, uh, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a toolbar. Just click on participants, and then that's where the raise hand feature is. Oh, raise hand. Thank you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Josie. Hi, um, I wanted to ask about the star abatement program. Um, is the agency open? Are they closed? Um, we haven't gotten any information for our co-op. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but if you all drop my email in the chat, if you want to email me, um, I will be able to get back to you and find out more information about that. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other hands? No other hands. Okay, thank you so much, Luke. Thank you, everyone. Uh, hi, a hand just went up. Oh, okay. Alistair. Uh, yes, hi, sorry, I'll try to put my screen on. Um, hi, um, to, 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 to respond to, to what Olympia said, I've, I've been talking to my commercial tenants directly and I've been working out um, uh, rent concessions with them in various different ways. One thing I found, uh, and I'm told the commercial tenants I'm talking about are uh, restaurants and bars in the East Village, is I've set up a program where my commercial tenants pay 10% of their net sales towards rent uh, instead of 
paying what the rent is according to the lease because we obviously want to keep the businesses in place and we don't want businesses to uh, shut down. Uh, the way we got to that number was my commercial tenant suggested that. Um, and I said, how, how do you come to 10%? And they showed me, they opened their books to me and they showed me. Prior to COVID was about 10% of the net sales, which was very, very surprising to me um, in that that's really a very small portion of their expenses. And when I asked them what, uh, what is their major cost and um, the wages is actually the largest cost for them. So we do want to help the small businesses as much as we can. Um, and obviously rent is a factor, but it's a really, when you look, actually look at the numbers, at least with the commercial tenants that I'm dealing with, it's a very small percentage of their cost. Um, so you might be able to move the needle a little bit on the rent, but it's really not going to be a significant number. There are other expenses that really affect the uh, commercial tenants, and I think that has to be considered um, in the big picture and scheme of things. Thank you. Okay, thank you. What? Thank you, um, Alistair, for helping Olympia with that question. That's really awesome, actually. Um, and we should talk about that, you and I. Um, okay, next we're going to go, if there's no other questions from anyone else. No, okay. Um, the borough president, is she here yet? Hi, she'll be here in a few minutes, she says. Okay, can I go to the next person? I have no issue with that. Okay, thank you. Um, Congresswoman uh, Nydia Velasquez, anyone from her office here? Michael, no? Okay. Um, Assembly member Yulaine Yu. Uh, hold on, Shivani is in the uh, attendee list. Okay. I'm here. I'm good evening. It's Gail. Oh, okay. Hi, Shivani, can you hear me? Now, yeah. Awesome. Um, all right, I will keep it quick. Um, the biggest thing is that Eileen joined a budget justice press conference this month to speak about the need for her bill on stock buybacks um, and increasing revenue for our state, which we so desperately need right now to fund housing and help with small businesses and schools and all of that. So that's something that she's really been focusing on a lot. Um, she also went on a small, um, a small business walkthrough with fellow elected officials to check in with merchants and businesses um, in Chinatown and the surrounding areas to discuss the needs, um, their needs as we slowly reopen, as well as the possibility of an open street and a night market. Um, we also last week hosted and sponsored a mobile COVID testing unit operation um, with health and hospitals um, at the corner of Cherry and Market Slip. That's done for now, but we're gonna try really hard to do something similar because um, all results were sent out within 48 hours, which as we're learning is very quick turnaround time for COVID testing in New York City. Um, so we hope to work on something similar very soon. Um, she also attended a public hearing um, on the most recent storm, which led to the second biggest Con Ed outage in history. So um, focusing on that and um, making sure that we put um, sustainability and all of that at the forefront of our plans in lower Manhattan. And then finally, um, she has continued, our whole office has continued to do PPE distribution. So if you know of any organization or group or anything like that who needs masks, hand sanitizers, help with food donations, anything like that, please feel free to contact our office. Um, and that is all for me, unless anyone has any questions. Michael, any hands? No hands. And just a reminder, um, questions at this point are only allowed from board members. So I, I see there's people in the attendee tab that keep raising their hands. At this point, only board members are allowed to ask questions. Um, if you're in the attendee list for another reason and that you keep raising your hand for, you need to just uh, send a chat or a uh, message to let us know what it is that you keep raising your hand for. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you, Shivani. Thank you. Okay. Um, now we're going to move on to uh, Assembly Member Harvey Epstein. Oh, I'm sorry. Is Gail here now? I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Yep. Okay. Oh, great. 
I'll be very Our quick. president is here. <laughs> thank you very much. I'll be very quick. I just want to say always a thank to uh, board three. I just want to talk about the small businesses because not only did we tour and you know Avenue A and 14th Street in Houston, but I've now completed from the top of Manhattan to the bottom of Manhattan in the last five days. We've been to Chinatown several times. And what I'm finding just, there's always the usual rent and some of the restaurants are doing okay. They're worried about October 31. But this is the other issue is uh, in your area, you have a lot, not a lot, but you have a few in terms of tourism. These are people who sell stuff that I have to say you and I will not purchase. It's the tchotchkes for the tourists. They are making $3 a day and they owe 90 to 100,000 in rent. So I'm actually gonna to write to, you know, I don't even know if I can do anything, but I'm gonna try with NYC and company, the governor and the mayor, because when you're underground, they are in the deep, deep cellar. Um, the restaurants and the, and the uh, retails, we can help in some ways, because we have tourism, we have uh, people like us who will purchase food, clothing and so on, but they are not selling one item. So I just want to bring that to your attention because you do have quite a few in board three. Uh, they don't exist uptown as much. I just want to mention that because I was almost in tears when, when um, I heard that. The second issue I want to mention is just, I know you're tired of hearing about the census, but just so uh, you understand, we have now gotten a list from the board of elections of everybody who has left town and their address. And uh, with the folks from uh, the mayor's office of census, we are sending a letter uh, to so-and-so, please use your New York City address. We also gave out funding that came from the governor very late, but every borough president got a, uh, we got 215,000 and we sent it to groups in board three as well as elsewhere, because yes, people are knocking on doors, but we need every supplemental, complemental uh, group we can think of, not really English what I'm saying, but the concept is everybody and uh, needs to be in support of getting those surveys filled out. I know in Chinatown, they're working really hard to do that. So uh, we're trying. We're also doing another postcard. We did one to 140,000. We're doing another one to 140,000 uh, to those who are in the lower census track in terms of responding. And I was with today people from census and they're doing the same. So it's not for lack of effort. Um, I do want to um, thank Vision Urbana. I think there's a gentleman named Eric Diaz, whom we all know and love. Um, and, uh, and UA3, because they're working together. Uh, we were together recently giving out fresh food, working with some farmers on the Lower East Side, but more importantly, with Council Member Margaret Chin and I, Eric Diaz and Vision Urbana will have a new community center um, in NYCHA. So congratulations, because the space is gonna be beautiful and God knows we certainly need it. I do wanna thank Council Member Carlina Rivera for the work she's doing in terms of the, I would say violent arrest of a citizen six months ago and I do believe the police officer should be fired and I know that you're aware of that. I just want to also thank um, Valadic for putting together the round table. I was giving out uh, PPE and uh, sanitizer uptown all day but I know that Deputy Borough President uh, Matthew Washington was there and he's a lot better than I am at everything. Um, I know that you're working on the east side coast of resiliency. Uh, you know you know better than I all the challenges I just want to thank you for your leadership. We got to work very, very closely. The city needs to work very, very closely with you. We're certainly working with the composting issue and I don't want to go through the, all the issues, except to say it's probably the largest project um, at any park, maybe anywhere in the country. And we're all going to be focused on it uh, like white on rice. Tomorrow at 7.45, I know that the Congresswoman is going to be joining us. So we're going to be in uh, Central Park. This is not in your district, but it is relevant. I am pretty excited. Um, today's show is coming, and this is uh, Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, first women statue, real women, in Central Park. Needless to say, there's a lot of interest. They were suffragists. Um, the law passed a uh, uh, 100 years ago on August 26th. It was signed. So it's, an, it's a big deal, and I think it's exciting that um, there is a lot of interest now in the suffragists and their diversity and their challenges. Um, and you're welcome to come join us and see it. I'll be there from 12 noon on. The ceremony is early, early in the morning. I hope that the outdoor dining is working. You have an awful lot of them in District 3. Um, I would say that from my, you know, being from one 
end of the borrow to the elder in the last five days, um, I would say 35% is kind of where the restaurants are at in terms of what they're uh, getting compared to what they need. They all want to have indoor. A lot of them have put in new filters. They have cleaned inside. Um, and there's a lot of push to try to also do indoor dining because it exists in Westchester and Long Island. I don't know what the governor's going to do on that. But I will say um, that we have to make sure that uh, October 31 is not the deadline, particularly if the weather stays nice. Schools are a challenge. I don't, I'm sure you're dealing with it. <coughs> the mayor keeps pushing the changing the situation in terms of what he's supporting. We all wanted outdoor and now we have outdoor. So we're in touch with the CECs and certainly with all the schools. Thank you very much and uh, congratulations to all the work that uh, Community Board 3 is doing. Got a question from Michelle Cooper-Smith. <coughs> Sorry. I don't see her here. Oh, I'm Go here. To Go to the top. Oh, this I think top. Alicia is talking. Um, have to leave it on top. Go ahead, Michelle. I hear you. Go sorry. Ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Gail, for coming. And I, I apologize for sounding like a broken record, but the NYPD is still barricading itself yes. in yep. specifically, I mean, down by Chambers Street. It's, it's an abomination, in my opinion, and shows really that the NYPD does not have any sort of civilian control. And the mayor keeps saying it's temporary, but they've been up for three months now. So I'm just wondering if you've um, been able to make any progress on that. And I, yes. I thank you for all the work you've done thus far. Well, we're, I, to be honest with you, I don't want to spill all the beans, but we've been to every single precinct in the borough of Manhattan. And so we're about to let the police know how we feel about it. And your import has been phenomenal. I say, Michelle, 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 every time at every precinct, even though it's not in your area. <gasps> I, I appreciate it. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> I will leave it at that for now. <laughs> thank you. Trevor has his hand up. Hi, Trevor. Hi, just a quick question and thank you for all you do. With regards to schools and outdoors, and I understand the need to go outdoors, uh, but we're not in a warm climate. So what is the expectation of these classrooms once it starts to get chilly or it rains all week long? Is there a space that we're gonna move, in, move kids into when we don't have that space? And also speaking from my childhood where I grew up going, wanting to go to school because it was warm and not necessarily warm in my home. So I look forward to school to get some warmth. So I'm just wondering what the city's plan is for that. Trevor, I have no idea. I, I, I made a mistake and said open school was gonna be a shit show and I got in a lot of trouble. I would say that um, there are some schools who have the ability to uh, rent a tent, to be honest with you, and they're doing it. And then there are some schools that I'm gonna try to help them rent a tent. Um, some schools don't have the outdoor space. It's, it's very up in the air. I don't know the answer to your question, uh, to be honest with you. It, it's, I don't have an answer. I mean, every school is different. We're trying to be in touch with every principal, every CEC. The UFT is doing the same. Um, it, I think it's challenging. There are a lot of kids, I talk to kids, they want to go back. They're very clear about it. And yet, you know, people are concerned for all the reasons and many more that you just listed. So I, I don't know the answer to your question. I okay. just, it is a question. Thank you. I see Robin's hand and then Olympia. Um, hi, Gail. Nice to see you. Thanks for um, on the note, on the sort of same similar subject around schools and kids, um, I, I don't know if you've been working at the Parks Department at all because I know that um, permits have not been uh, given to youth uh, athletic leagues outside of schools, which I believe there's no, I, I think there's some changes to the PSLL, but there was no. There are no there are no sports happening um, in schools, and so the outside leagues are important for kids. You know, I don't know if you've been aware of that at all. Oh yes, I have about 800 emails on that topic, and um, certainly we're working on a letter as we. I don't know what else to do to the parks department. And what is happening all around the borough is that people are just taking over the field and playing, and the parks department's lower level staff is upset because they have no liability, they have no no knowledge of who it is. And there could be other issues. So I think they should get permits, then they know who's playing there, et cetera. So we will push for the advocacy that you just listed. Makes no literally, I see every field is people are playing, but they have no permits. That's a bigger problem in many cases. Yeah. Okay, well thanks, Gail. Olympia? Yes, and my question, Gail, is also about schools. 
we have complete lack of leadership right now. So last week we were over a hundred parents and teachers until 3.30 a.m. at the panel of education. And if you or your staff haven't had a chance to review that, please do so because Chancellor Carranza behaved uh, abominably screaming to women and uh, that was inappropriate. But you can be our leader right now because the real answer is actually we need funds. The Cuomo, our governor, already appropriated 1.1 billion that was supposed to go on education in the CARES Act. And uh, right now they're suggesting 20% additional cuts. And the chancellor went on the record and said, if that happens, they're gonna be not only only remote, but they're gonna lay off 9,000 uh, employees from DOE minimum. So right now, they, uh, there is complete lack of leadership from the mayor and the governor, and you are our hope for a voice of sanity. So please fight for our safety, our children, all of New Yorkers. There needs to be funding for the public schools, and the neediest people need to get real priority. So equitable planning and safe planning with resources, please. Thank, thank you, Linda. I'll do the best I can. Thank you so much. I'm Burr President. I, I just wanted to um, say something. I think um, I'm very concerned about something that's about to happen in the next couple of weeks. The children are supposed to go back to school on the 10th. And so the food program that we've been giving the public is supposed to end on the 9th of September. Um, as you know, I'm a cook for the DOE. And I am very concerned about my community. The people that I see coming to my doors are not just senior citizens, but they're also many of the most neediest of people. Um, and many of them have not been children that come to my school door and I feed over 800 a day. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm saying to you that the concern is what is going to happen. The mayor has not said anything. He has not prepared the public as to what's going to happen when those doors close. I do understand from my supervisory that we have some schools in our districts that will provide meals from three to five, but many of them are not in the same area. Many of them will be at quite of a distance for many residents to get to. They have not posted any flyers. They have not said any, nothing has been announced about the food. And I am very concerned about feeding my community. So please, please stay on top of that. Thank you. I have been, Catherine Garcia, I've been bugging her, asking her what is happening because the centers, thanks to you and others, have been very successful and got it through the pandemic in a way couldn't have. So I, I appreciate that. And your in, inside information is helpful. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am on it, but I will be more on it. Thank you so much. Okay, having no other hands, I'm going to... Um, and no other hands for our uh, borough president. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Gail, for coming thank out tonight. Thank you so much. Um, okay, we're going to move on. Uh, Assembly Member Harvey Epstein. Any representatives? Anyone here from Harvey's office? Hi, everybody. It's Aura from Assembly Member Harvey Epstein's Hi. office. How are you? Um, so this past weekend we had a save the post office rally um harvey's really concerned over um how it will impact the right to vote safely um and so elected officials and community members came out to support in that um we harvey has been listening to the need for commercial rent relief um and he has introduced a bill that he thinks will um, provide adequate support for both uh, commercial renters and landlords. Um, so if you can, uh, you can take a look at the report, it has more um, in detail information for you. Um, we also need to raise revenue as Olympia and many others have mentioned, the Department of Education is suffering and we're really, really concerned about what will happen when these cuts take place um, and how it will impact the neediest people and neediest New Yorkers who have already experienced so much during this pandemic. Um, and so Harvey and 103 members signed a letter to push um, an increase in revenues similar to our MES debt um, uh, bill that we passed last year or tried to pass last year. Um, 
we also um, want to let everyone know that there is a LES Sports Academy basketball camp and you can register um, and look at the different age groups and dates that uh, this is taking place in case you wanna register. Um, we also have an event coming up. Um, well, Why Not Care has an event coming up. It's the fourth annual festival. It's from 12 to five. We need some volunteers to come out. So if anybody wants to register, I put it all the way at the bottom. You can email Lila Mejia, um, who's coordinating volunteers for that day and the day before to um, get those book bags ready for parents who need um, supplies for their children. And we're also planning a virtual open house on Thursday, September 17th. So if you can, please save the date. Um, I put the report in all the way at the top, but I think I'm going to put it in again in case people are joined a little later. Thank you. Thank you. Any, let me see, I don't see any hands. No hands. Okay. Thank you so much. Next, uh, we have our State Senator Brian Cavanaugh. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I just want to make you aware in advance that my four-year-old colleague is running around, uh, so please excuse him if he interrupts. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll try and go as quickly as possible. In regards to fair housing, we've uh, introduced a state level obligation to affirmatively further fair housing to step in when the federal government has failed us. This was in response to the president's uh, rescinding of a HUD rule requiring all localities receiving federal funding for housing and community development to do so in a manner that affirmatively further fair housing. Um, as as far as homeowner relief, in July, we passed extensive mortgage forbearance that'll help a great deal of New Yorkers. Um, even with a blanket forbearance program though, homeowners will still require financial relief for their taxes and utilities, for which we are currently lobbying the Congress. Um, we have introduced the Small Business Recovery Lease Act of 2020 in collaboration with Assemblymember New. Um, this act would limit annual rent increases through incentivizing the restructuring and renegotiating uh, leases. Owners who participate would receive tax abatements and then tenants, small business tenants would receive more manageable rents. Um, as far as uh, community, we have recently been in collaboration with the MTA to provide a, a public forum regarding the Rutgers 2 project. Uh, we are currently trying to figure out dates for that. Um, CB, the community board had requested if we could do uh, or get SLA weekly updates um, during the district cabinet meeting and we volunteered to follow up. Uh, we were provided with a downloadable Excel sheet listing statewide summaries and charges through August 21st and August 23rd. Um, we're not sure if that's going to be updated or when, how often that's going to be updated. So we're just awaiting uh, a return response to follow up. And our office in collaboration with Assembly Member New, Council Member Rivera, Congresswoman Velasquez, wrote a letter to the parks in, in support of the compost yard remaining in the park and securing space included in the final design plan of ESCR. And that's all we have this evening. Thank you. Um, any hands? No hands? No. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Okay, uh, next we have uh, Senator Brad, Brad Holyman. Hi all, Zach from Brad Hoyleman's office. Caroline is on a well-deserved vacation right now. Um, just one legislative update and one local update for you guys. On the legislative side, um, Brad has been working hard to pass a bill which would put drop boxes across New York. We've talked a lot about the post office problems already. We think that it's important for New York State to provide a means for New Yorkers to drop off their absentee ballots that doesn't involve potential interference or delay from the USPS. And so in 33 other states, um, we've seen the states establish drop boxes that they control through their normal, their local board of elections, where you can go and they've, they've set these up on street corners, just like your, your post office boxes. You can go and drop your ballot off. Employees from the state go and pick those up 
And that way you have some confidence that it's not going to have any federal interference. So Brad has a bill which would establish these. Um, we're hoping that we can get that done legislatively or if not by executive order. Uh, again, it's happened in 33 other states. So um, we've seen the example of how this works um, and we're hoping to get that done soon. Um, on the local side, uh, many of the elected officials on this call joined Brad in a letter to the NYPD um, in June where we uh, called attention to the, the issues around their having build the block meetings and other local meetings where they weren't uh, providing any remote or call-in options, which is a really difficult thing as we know for a lot of the immunocompromised and elderly um, residents that we have in our, our neighborhood. Um, the NYPD told us in a response to that letter that they would have call-in options by the beginning of August. And at least in uh, many of the, the CBs that we've heard from, that's not been the case. So we've again written to them um, and put out a, a statement in the press uh, criticizing the NYPD at this point for not um, providing for an option for people to engage in the public safety conversations that are happening right now um, in a way that's safe um, and maximizing of uh, all the participation that we can have. Uh, the sender himself uh, today participated in the second um, uh, part of a vaccine trial, um, which he's been participating in at NYU Langone. Um, he's uh, one of uh, I believe 30,000 people across the country in this particular trial who uh, is receiving a stage three vaccine um, and then reporting back to them on uh, any side effects and symptoms to make sure that we have a vaccine um, coming quickly and that's effective and safe for everyone. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Zach. I see Susan's hand. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, um, Zach, on the letter to the police, First, no, we're not getting call-in options. Um, I would like to add to that, that when the meetings are held in the precinct, um, the police are not wearing masks and they're going in the elevators with the public without masks, which I think is a big deterrent to coming to meetings. It mm. prevented me from coming to the last meeting. And just last, could you um, uh, copy us on, on those letters? Because they're really important. We appreciate you writing them. Of course. I'll forward Thank them you. to you right after this. Thank you. And I'll put a board report for everyone in the, the chat right now. Hey, your hand is up. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, Zach. And thanks to all the representatives who showed up uh, tonight and, and uh, reps of the reps. Um, there's been a, um, a pushback in the, in the state legislature about um, the full immunity that was granted um, was stuck in a bill. Nobody saw it, nobody knew it. Uh, the full immunity granted to nursing home providers who uh, their lobbyists wrote the bill. I mean, they admitted it, <laughs> they bragged about it. And I just wondered, I hear there's a new version coming out that wants to roll it back entirely, not just the version that uh, was uh, that this legislature just agreed to. Do you know any more about that? And I would have the same question to all the state legislators, but uh, you can put it in the chat. I don't need to. Sure, I would just say very quickly, I, I'll look, look to update you on the specific legislation, but the Senate did hear, um, I believe there was a joint hearing with the assembly to um, hearings recently on nursing homes, yeah. which the yeah, senator participated I, in. Yes, I testified at it. Um, sure. Yeah, um, as did a number of other advocates, but uh, I, my question is specific to the immunity bill. Okay. So, thank you. Yep. Okay. I don't see any other hands. Thank you, Zach. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Now we have our councilwoman, uh, council member, Marva Chin. Marion, I saw hey you. Everybody. Good evening, everyone. Um, Marion here. Um, so just wanted to go really quickly, uh, Kay, on the immunity conversation. I mean, city council doesn't have much jurisdiction on nursing homes. It is very, very extremely regulated by the state. Um, but we have been really engaged in the conversation. I mean, we've, we've known since the onset of the pandemic, it has essentially just turned into 
a war zone. Um, a lot of them intentional decisions and unintentional decisions. Um, immunity was a was a was an issue that um, really spoke to the council member. We drafted a letter. Uh, she sent a letter to um, the state office, Department of Health office, um, and their commissioner on a few different concerns and needs um, around nursing homes. Uh, the day after the hearing happened um, in early August, um, we were going to send a re or create a resolution to ask the state to repeal immunity. And I believe that bill has been passed, Sepulveda's bill. Um, uh, so we were told there's no need to issue a resolution. I believe that the bill number is S8835. Um, and I'm happy to share the language here. Hopefully that, that that would answer your question. There are a lot of other larger concerns around nursing homes, especially around adequate PPE, cleaning, visitation. Um, they have an unbelievable uh, timing threshold that they need to meet in order for family to come back and see their family members, because um, it really has been a while. Um, and Council Member Chin um, has been outlining that in her letter. And so we hope to hear of a response. There's a separate conversation um, that we're also trying to dig into regarding uh, voluntary evictions. Basically, nursing homes can essentially kick you out. Um, we're worried that this is going to be underlined and tied to their profit margin. So um, we only found about it the story through the New York Times. So we're reaching out to providers like Mobilization for Justice, Chinese American Planning Council um, on how we can help. So that's um, that's us on the nursing home front. Um, so I'll, I'll share more aging updates. Um, Margaret is still very uh, much engaged on the age discrimination conversation. I think now with COVID, it's been more underscored, uh, especially for the job losses. I believe you know our older our older New Yorkers, especially those from communities of color, have been hurt the most. Um, and we know that age discrimination affects people of all ages, uh, but especially for older workers, we need protection. Actions. Um, not only is she pushing for her package that she introduced a couple of years ago uh, to create age discrimination guidelines, she is able to partner with the New York City Commission on Human Rights this month to announce new rules specifically targeted towards fighting age discrimination at every level of the job process and including in the workforce to protect more older workers and help them keep their jobs. Um, as the borough president mentioned, Margaret was really excited to join Vis Nirvana and UA3 um, on their Health Fast Food Pantry event uh, last week. Um, together, they were able to deliver um, um, almost 1 million pounds of fresh produce and groceries straight to the doors of our um, Section 8 housing, our NYCHA developments, our hard to access tenement buildings in Chinatown in the Lower East Side. Um, really goes to show you know, what can happen if we work together with our community organizations, but it also goes to show that there needs to be more when it comes to the city's emergency food response. And Alicia, um, I know that you mentioned this, um, a, a lot of the emergency food response programs that have been issued uh, since April are due to an OEM emergency rule. So there is actually a hearing this week um, where um, the Office of Emergency Management was, was getting testimonies. I can double check if they're still getting testimonies from providers and the public on um, feedback that they want on this emergency rule, who they want to see as stakeholders um, as part of the uh, process if we want to extend it, which we really do. Um, we want schools to continue serving food to the larger community, and we also want Get Food NYC to stay in track, but this time include the nonprofit providers who have that track record in serving, delivering door to door to their vulnerable constituents and including that wellness constituent case management access. Um, components so that you're not just dumping boxes of food outside of folks stores and allowing them to rot in the heat of the summer. Um, so we're continuing that conversation. Um, Margaret's also really excited, as the borough president mentioned, to have worked together with the borough president to provide funding so that this Nirvana can finally have a home of its own and expand its food pantry programs. Um, right now, this Nirvana, as many of you know, are, have been operating out of scattered spaces um, and really just like, depending on the gener generosity of our larger community organizations to provide that space. Um, so we're finally um, excited to start that path for um, a community center in Seward Park Extension. Um, uh, where it um, where it has based its all of its operations in um, on census um, 
small good news. I know that there's a lot of bad news around census, but Council District 1 um, increased um, from 29 to 28th place um, out of all of the 51 council dis districts in terms of the census response rate. Um, there's still a long way to go. Um, and especially now with the timeline curtailed on self-response, um, we're working with community organizations to do more census outreach. So it's uh, September 3rd, uh, please join us at Smith Houses for a census day. We'll be working with Hamilton Madison House, with Nirvana, um, and a few other community organizations to not only help people directly sign up for census and fill out their forms, but also come out with some free food and free groceries and produce. Um, I think those are my biggest updates. If you guys have any questions, let me know. I don't see any hands, Marion. Oh, there's Eric's hand. Okay, Eric, go ahead. Hi, Marion. Um, just wanted to uh, ask for that information on this OEM. Because um, unfortunately, we have not been part of that conversation, which sadly should have taken place. So any testimonies or any other information on that, please email us. Um, okay, I just got to... Okay, I see the public advocate. Uh, Philip Ellison? Are you there? Uh, yes, I am here. Okay. Okay, I, I can say a few words. Sure. Yeah, good, good afternoon. It's been a while. Um, CB3, Philip Ellison, the Manhattan Borough Advocate for uh, the Public Advocate, Jamani Williams. Um, good to see uh, everyone. I am kind of taking over their responsibilities as we had um, a liaison, um, but I'll be here throughout um, moving forward. Um, just a couple of things of, of, of note. Uh, one, this weekend, um, you know, you have a wonderful organization um, in your backyard and the Lower East Side, Why Not Care? Uh, I will be with them and uh, for their um, United Festival, and United Festival giving book bags. Um, so the Public Advocates Office, you know, through my collaboration with them and one of our national partners for voter registration headcount, will be providing PPE, um, uh, so masks for their event, and uh, also will be providing training on a QR code for voter registration as they go this on Sunday mm -hmm. to give out uh, book bags and food and uh, voter registration to 21 NYCHA developments. Um, so we're pretty excited about that to support the community in that way. I know I always see um, BP Brewer and uh, Epstein, um, you know, Assemblyman Ep uh, Harvey Epstein doing a lot of food distribution and helping out folks in the community. So I'm glad to join them as well and other folks uh, like Councilwoman Rivera um, and Chin. And so some of the other things that has been focused on, given the, the gun violence um, uh, epidemic during this time, um, the public advocate has been continuously pushing for um, these cure violence programs that the mayors are starting to adopting, starting to adopt. Uh, so that has been continuing to think about how do we uh, think about um, some of the violence and some of the lack of resources that during this time in different communities throughout uh, Manhattan and the city, particularly as community centers were closed and we know some youth didn't start until recently. Um, we've also really uh, been, been focusing on um, voter engagement and democracy building in our city and the census team um, has been upping up their their work with a coalition of folk of different community-based organizations in Manhattan uh, and that's been really important for us to have people engaged registered and also counted um, uh, in the city and there's a number of just legislation items that have come out recently that I'll make sure of this add a link so you all um, can see what what we've been up to and I do send an update email um, about the legislation, the events, uh, and so forth. And um, so I hope that can be shared with you all. So we have a wonderful evening and thanks for your time. Thank you. Um, last but not least, our council member, Carlina Rivera. Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Isabel Chandler. I'm representing council member Carlina Rivera. I will try to be very brief. I have three updates for you all. The first of which, which um, 
occurred recently was we had a community gathering um, since it has been now almost four months since um, LES resident Donnie Wright was brutally assaulted and arrested by Officer Garcia. Um, and Carlina also spoke at the CCRB hearing this month calling for answers on the investigation. Um, many of the elected officials um, present here were, were also, also joined. Um, I also wanted to say thank you so much, Alicia and um, Olympia for speaking on schools. It's um, on so many, many um, community members' minds. Um, <laughs> the lack of clarity um, and safety for students, parents, families, employees is extremely disturbing. And Carlina is in conversation with DOE and any feedback you have that you can share with our office, we would be so appreciative um, so that we can continue to advocate for um, schools to really have the proper infrastructure that they deserve to keep everyone safe. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to share that Carlina testified at this, um, well, not up in Albany, but remotely at uh, the state um, hearing on hospitals response to COVID, um, calling, to, <laughs> calling to not um, cut hospital budgets during a global pandemic. Um, and she will be hosting as hearings reopen this fall in the council. Um, she will be holding hearings on um, the public hospital, city hospitals response to COVID. So again, any feedback concerns you have about testing and tracing, um, anything really, we'd love to be in touch with you and, and uh, make sure that your voice is represented on these hearings in the fall. That's all for me, thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Any questions? Okay, I don't see any hands. All right, um, now we're going to, that closes off our elected officials report. Um, and we're going to go into our roll call and approval of minutes for July. Oh, for June, June and July, 2020. Sorry, okay. it's just July. Okay, um, David Adams. I think it was just June. Just June. On now? Just, June. Yeah. just June. Just June. Yes. Thank you. Your own Altman. Yes. Jesse Beck. Yes. Dominic Berg. Yes. Lee Berman. Yes. Carlin Chan. Yes. Jonathan Chu. Uh, Jonathan Chu. I don't think he's, don't on. Think he's on. Okay, thanks. David Crane. Yes. Oh, Felicia well. Crooks. Jonathan Chu is in the attendee list. I'm moving him over. Okay. Sorry. No, you're fine. Okay, Jonathan Chu. Yes. Thank you. Felicia Crookshank. Here. Felicia, we got you finally. <laughs> Thank you. Eric Diaz. Yes. Alistair Konamakis. Yes. Shirley Fennessy. Yes. Ryan Gillum. She's not here. Okay, thank you. Deborah Glass. Yes. Andrea Gordillo. Yes. Herman Hewitt. I saw Herman. Herman, you're on mute. Yes. Thank you. Trevor Holland. Yes. Linda Jones. Yes. Valentina Jones. Yes. Tatiana Jorio. Yes. Lisa Kaplan. Yes. Olympia Kazi. Yes. Joseph Kearns. I don't think he's on. Okay, thank you. Michelle Cooper Smith. Yes. May Lee. Yes. 
Wendy Lee. She's not on here. Okay, thank you. Alicia Lewis Coleman. Yes. David Louie. Yes. Ellen Liu. I know yeah. Ellen, there you go. Thank you. Michael Marino. Yes. Alexandra Militano. Yes. Michael Perlis. Okay, I don't see him. Tariq Ramos. Tariq Ramos, you're on mute. Yes. Thank you. Paul Rangel. Yes. Carolyn Radcliffe. Carolyn Radcliffe, you're on mute. Yes, can you hear me? Thank you. Yep, thank you. Damaris Reyes. Yes. Thank you. Richard Ropiak. Yes. Thomas Rosa. Yes. Robin Chattel. Yes. Heidi Schmidt. I don't believe she's on. Okay, thank you. Larissa Scheinberg. Yes. I don't believe she's on either. Thank no, you. I'm oh. That, sorry, she is. I'm sorry. Um, oh. I'm Marissa. I'm showing up. All right, Marissa. great. Thank you. Clint Smeltzer. Yes. Anisha Seepin. Yes. Sandra Struther. Let's see her. She's not on. Josephine Velez. Yes. Troy Velez. Yes. Rodney Washington. Not on. Kathleen Webster. Yes. Jackie Wong. Yes. Ricky Wong. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, so now we're going to go into our board reports. Um, so again, I just want to thank everyone for attending tonight's meeting. It's August, it's hot, <laughs> it's a lot. Um, we have a whole lot going on and around the district and we're still in the midst of a pandemic, right? Um, and so, but I'd like to just uh, thank the following people for agreeing to join the nominating committee as we're getting ready for the fall. We're moving forward um, on our board and the uh, following people are now the nominating committee, uh, Linda. Linda is the chair of the nominating committee, Sandra Strether, uh, Paul Rangel, Robin Chattel, and Ellen Liu. So all of these um, members are <laughs> uh, the nominating committee and I'm sure Linda will reach out to you um, in September and let you know what the deal is, okay? What you I wanna do. You that. <laughs> I'll be in touch. Linda will be in touch with everyone to let you know exactly what you need to do for that. Um, I want to talk about reaching out to me. I, a few people have uh, not been able to reach me. I don't know why. I, I try to make myself available. If you need to reach me for any reason at all, um, we have an email address. It's cb3, um, cb3chair at gmail.com. That's cb3chair at gmail.com. If you need to reach me, um, if you want to talk about something privately and you don't want to put it on the CB3's um, email address, you can email me at my private email address. And that's my name, Alicia Coleman at yahoo.com. Again, it's Alicia Coleman at yahoo.com. Um, I am not available from seven in the morning to three in the afternoon, obviously, because I work for the Board of Ed. And I get up very early in the morning, so um, I'm not available uh, in, the, in the middle of the day, but you definitely can reach me um, in the afternoon. It's been hectic at work, so I have not been able to stop what I'm doing, even to have a five-minute break to have lunch. So um, I will hopefully, when school reopens, I'll get my schedule back on track and I'll be able to maybe take a break at lunchtime. But in the meantime, I'm not being able to do that so I won't be able to read my emails until after 3 p.m. 
Um, so, but if you like to have a meeting with me or a conversation with me, you're always welcome to do so. Just hit me up on my email address. Um, and I will make myself available for you. Uh, I wanted to also say, so the pandemic is here, right? Spoiler alert, we're still in the midst of this pandemic and people are alone, people are hurt, people are displaced, people are hungry, they're stressed out and all these emotions are bottled up inside of everyone. I just want to continue to encourage you all to be kind to yourselves, be kind to one another, be kind to your neighbors. Um, as we're moving forward, we don't know if there's going to be a second wave of this thing. We're not really sure what's going to happen. Please, you know, continue to do all the best things you can to take care of yourselves and to take care of your loved ones. Um, I know that many people in our district have lost some loved ones. I don't know the count, the numbers. I'm not sure about the stats. I'm sure we're going to find out relatively soon as to um, the amount of people that have passed away due to COVID um, illnesses. So we just want to make sure that we give each other some patience and some time and try to be sensitive for various reasons. Um, and that's not just to say, you know, you all have to pay, play social work or anything like that. But I just think that in, in the form of being a, a good neighbor, I think that's what I'm trying to say, um, is just to be kind to one another, okay? Um, and that's it for my report. And have a great summer. <laughs> the rest of what's left of the summer. Um, okay, so now the chair's report, uh, the district manager's report. Susan? Okay, thank, thank you. Um, I want to address one issue tonight that um, people have been um, calling the office a lot, both um, residents and board members. And this is about the people we're seeing on the street. Um, conditions are unlike we have seen in many years. Uh, people are comparing it to the 70s and there are similarities. Uh, first of all, I want to say people we have on the street, um, they tend to all be lumped together as homeless people. They're not all homeless people. There are homeless people. Um, there are drug dealers. There are drug users. There are mentally ill people. And there are many people in many of these categories. Um, Susan, you're on mute. Okay. Was I on, on mute the whole time or just no? Part of it. Toward okay. the end, you, you trailed off after you said there are many people in many of these categories. Okay, so, um, so I just wanted people to be aware that it's not just homeless um, or just one group of people on the street. Um, I have particularly been asked to um, address the area around um, Lower Second Avenue uh, because there were uh, so many people using drugs very openly on the street. Um, the other area that I think is the, um, the most dangerous and, um, you know, is very serious is around SD, Sarah Delano Roosevelt Park. Um, Regarding the area around Lower Second Avenue, um, this has changed uh, very recently. Um, Nativity Church is not where many people were sleeping, um, has now been boarded up for construction. Um, people should be aware also that all the shelter residents from Third Street Men's Shelter and from Kenton Hall have been relocated to the Upper West Side. You've probably um, seen news uh, news programs about uh, them on the Lower East Side. Um, I spoke to the NCO uh, for that area, and he believes that um, many of the people that were on the street that we're not seeing now um, were from Brooklyn and they were there to sell drugs to the shelter residents. He is now saying that because the residents, the shelter residents are gone, um, that there's less people on the street. However, tonight around five o'clock, I saw five of the same usual 
uh, apparent drug dealers at the corner of Third Street and Second Avenue um, that are there, even though the shelter residents are not there. So we clearly can't blame everything on that. People are also complaining about lack of enforcement. Um, there is drug enforcement. Um, there have been summonses, you know, so the way the law is now, most of it is oath summonses. Um, people are off the street about two hours and there is, seem, there is no place um, provided except for people to go back on the street. Um, it's just an untenable situation. Um, outreach is out there every day doing everything they can. Um, they recently moved one of the individuals um, from in front of Nativity Church into, house, um, into supportive housing. They're generally safe havens. And they are successfully engaging with about three people between 2nd and 7th Street. Um, it doesn't seem like it's productive because every time they get people, into safe havens, you often see more people on the street. There is no plan. I have, you know, I can't give a lot of hope about this because when people, an area is quote cleaned up, they're moved someplace else. And what happens is the people that the homeless outreach were engaging, they've now lost track of them. So um, they have to start all over or they may be starting all over with different outreach workers. The city seems to have no plan for this, um, and I, I really don't know. I don't know how to address it. And I, I can acknowledge it. Um, there are certain areas where you may see someone with, like, extreme mental problems that we can try and work on with that individual, um, but there doesn't seem to be a good plan on addressing it. People, um, I do know that. Uh, Chief of staffs of almost all the elected officials have once a week calls, and this is a topic every week. And, you know, I, so I want people to at least be aware that their complaints are, are acknowledged, people are aware. Um, I think there needs to be policy changes from the city. And I don't know much else I can, I can say about that, to be honest. Um, I don't know if anyone wants, has any comments or wants to ask any questions about that. Okay. Um, I don't see any hands. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, because this had come up a lot, um, I promised that I would speak, uh, say what I can about it tonight. Um, and I'm sorry that I can't give more good information. Thank you, Susan. Um, we're now going to move into our committee reports if there's no questions for Susan. Okay, we'll be going into our committee reports and members of the public, as you know, as in whenever we're in together, this is a time for business. So we will not be taking any questions from the public at this time in the chat rooms or so forth. Okay, um, health, seniors, and human services. Maylee? Uh, hi, good evening. Um, we discussed district needs last month. And that's it. Any questions? I don't see any hands. No. Thank you, May. Sure. Okay, SLA. Oh, you're the hot topic. <laughs> um, so we received stipulations for all the items we approved, except for number three, which is Bell Fry's um, Foods LLC at 132 Ludlow Street. So I, I drafted an alternative resolution that I asked the board office to send out in advance so everybody could review, uh, because rather than just saying we're denying this because they they didn't sign the stipulations. I included a couple of additional paragraphs which can direct you to. Um, um, Alex, would you like me to bring that up on the screen or no? You can, it's kind of long, which is, so I actually went through it and I summarized the, you know, I checked off the paragraphs that were different from 
um, the original resolution, which was a resolution to approve. So let me just. The first 14 paragraphs are the same. The 15th whereas clause, which starts with subsequent to the meeting where the applicant was heard, includes additional information that Susan provided from uh, the police officers who responded to what this location had in May, which was this huge uh, luxury vehicle event that's detailed in much of this resolution. Um, and which brought uh, scores of cars and people to the street. It cordoned the street off and had an outdoor DJ. DJ. Um, and after the subsequent whereas clause, I added in a sort of a summary of the evidence that supported that the applicant had been responsible or one of the other principals or his daughter, who he says is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations, had been responsible for this event based on the things that I had outlined in the previous paragraphs. Um, the other change paragraphs are the last four. Um, so rather than um, the last paragraph being all of the stipulations that we had asked it to sign, the um, third from the bottom whereas clause, which is big, is what we asked them to sign. Uh, the next whereas clause is that they would not sign them. Um, the next whereas clause is in essence um, that we do not believe, consequently do not believe that they should be issued a license. And then finally, just a, a therefore asking or recommending the denial of the application. And the whereas above the therefore is that they shouldn't be issued a license because of the size and character of the business and the hosting of the event, which is not a indicative of how it's going to run its, or is not a good indication of how it's going to run its operation and that it wouldn't sign the stipulations. Any, any questions for Alex? I had one other thing if there are no questions, but I'll wait. To about, the, about that item, no, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the one other thing is not about the item. So there are no questions. No raised hands. Okay. So the one other thing is that I just omitted in item number seven, community comment. So I, uh, and, uh, and um, the person who spoke at the committee meeting sent me an email subsequent to the e meeting restating her concerns, which reminded me that I had not put this in. So. I just drafted two paragraphs to correct that. So um, on item number seven, which is Dina Restaurant, 162 to 166 Second Avenue, above the paragraph that references what the questionnaire says, uh, should be two paragraphs. And I just have to exit the full screen so I can look at my, and I was just proposing to add in um, whereas a representative of the East Village Community Coalition and organizations serving area businesses and residents appeared to express concerns that the applicant had recently changed its business name to Mehana, which is displayed on the facade of the business and that it has a much larger outdoor seating area than the applicant described, including seating within its build, building line and seating on the public sidewalk. Although she could find no timber seating permit issue for this business, um, and should be comma as evidenced by a photograph of the dining area of the business that she submitted subsequent to the meeting. And whereas the applicant stated that it had changed its business name to Mahana and was awaiting a permit for temporary outdoor dining, uh, but otherwise had only four tables with eight seats within its building line. And I typed those out so that they could, I could give them to Michelle if they're going to be added. Okay. That's good. Okay. Anybody have any questions for Alex? No, no questions. All right, Alex. Thank you. Um, all right. Next, we're going on to landmarks. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I hope everybody had a chance to read through this very long resolution. Uh, regarding PS64 
uh, Charles El Bahio, uh, 605 East 9th Street. Um, we've heard Harry testify uh, in, as, as one of the people who brought this to our attention. Um, I'm just going to go, and since you didn't get a chance, probably everybody to read it, and I don't blame you. Um, the first bunch of, of whereas is in the resolution kind of recite the history of what's happened at Charis over the years, and I don't think we need to reiterate that. So I'm going to start at the end with about the last four whereas is. Um, Whereas CB3 suffered a terrible loss when the similarly vacant and neglected landmark Beth Hamadrash Hagadol on North Street suffered an arson file and was burned down. Um, that fire was because teenagers got into the synagogue and set fires in there. And that's what we're concerned about happening again. Uh, whereas CB3 does not want to experience a repeat of that demolition by neglect, that also resulted in a loss of life. And whereas the current title holder of 605 East 9th Street is the subject of foreclosure action for failure to pay the mortgage and therefore may not have the inclination or be in the financial position to pay for urgently needed repairs. And whereas the present and persistent condition of the building is a danger and a hazard to life and property. Therefore be it resolved. CB3 recommends the following actions. The first bullet, NYC DOB should immediately properly secure the building, make emergency repairs and bill the owner. Uh, second one, due to public safety issues at the building, including but not limited to fire hazard and materials that could fall off at any time, CB3 asks DOB to require that the owner provide authorizations for the NYPD to enter the building. Um, the next, LPC take legal action to compel repairs and issue the maximum fines retroactively and moving forward. Uh, the next, the city should place a lien on the property and send a letter with a copy of this resolution to the lender of the owner to make them aware of these issues. And then finally, the city LPC should retain a preservation engineer as soon as possible to assess the building for potential hazards for areas where the building has been structurally compromised and the exterior envelope for points of potential water infiltration and degradation of original building materials. Be it further resolved, CB3 reiterates its call made in a resolution in 2013 requesting that the de Blasio mayoral administration return the former PS64 school building to the community by legally retrieving and then selling or giving it to a well-established not-for-profit organization with a long history of serving the people of the Lower East Side East Village including but not limited to restoring the not-for-profit organization known as Charis El Bojillo to the building located at 605 East 9th Street. Um, I would just say that the meeting where we discussed this was very well attended, much more so than the usual Landmarks Committee meeting. And uh, the community was very outspoken. There were many, many people came to talk, you know, give examples of bad things that are happening around that building. And that's what impelled us to write this resolution. I'm open to questions. Shall okay, I? I see Lisa Kaplan's hand and then David. Yeah, um, I, I wonder if, um, I, first of all, let me say I 100% support the intent of this resolution. Um, I couldn't agree more that this is really an outrage and a scourge on the neighborhood. But I think that the, it, it's a very good resolution, but it could be even stronger if we quoted something that Harry actually mentioned in his testimony tonight, where he referred to a statement made by Mayor de Blasio at a town hall meeting. And I looked it up, I believe it was in October of 2017, where he stated his intent to pursue the city's acquisition of PS64 and return it to community use. And I would like to suggest a friendly amendment to add the following words to that, be it further resolved, um, uh, motion, uh, part of the motion, so that it would say, be it further resolved, consistent with the statement made by Mayor de Blasio at a town hall meeting uh, he held in October 2017, where he stated his intent to pursue city acquisition of PS64 and return it to community use, comma, 
CB3 reiterates its call, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as written. And I could provide that written um, uh, change to the secretary. Yeah, I would definitely accept that as a friendly amendment. Thank you. Okay, I see David Crane and then Carolyn. You're muted, David. Okay, uh, I originally raised my hand to make a point of order about SLA, so remember to come back to me after this report. But now I'll make one about what just happened. Can we please get a, if there are no objections, so that we don't make a decision by two people? Yeah, should I be the one that says that or? Yes. If you are chairing the section, you should, thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to say that right now. So if there are no objections, I accept the friendly amendment. Okay. Thank you, David, appreciate it. Yeah, I know I'm being a stickler here, but it gives an opportunity for someone to feel like they could raise their, nobody's gonna be against this, well, you're, you're the best. but Thank you just should be in the habit. <clears throat> Yes. Thank you, David. Okay, Carolyn. Um, I want to thank Linda for bringing this forward and Harry. This is an issue that impacts on the blocks of 9th, 10th, and 8th Street in particular. We're all worried about the ongoing devastation to the building, and the city needs to take an action and the vandalism that is not only putting our lives at risk, it's putting the lives of the kids who are doing the vandalism at risk. They've been sitting on the parapet. They've taken a pickaxe and broken off the chimney things. It's unbelievable what they're doing. And it's being used like a clubhouse. for it Carolyn, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, Carolyn, but do you have a question for Linda about the resolution? Resolution is great, and I'm hoping that everybody will support it because of this. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Now, David, you wanted to go back on something. Can we finish this up and yes. then you can go back? Okay. Oh, great. yeah. Finish up uh, 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 Linda's committee, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Linda? All right. What? Are we good, we good with the resolution? Everyone? Yes. I, I, no further questions, so I yeah. can vote on it at the end. Okay. Thank all right. you all. All righty. Okay. Okay. So back on SLA, it seems that we maybe, or maybe we didn't, made a bunch of decisions about a bunch of modifications. The last words I heard were Alex saying, if we add this, and then I heard Alicia say something like, thank you, and then we went on to the next committee. So I'm sorry, to, if we, we should approve. go back because it was, uh, she did make an amendment. There was an amendment to her original um, stipulation. There wasn't an amendment to the stipulation, yes. There was an, an amendment to the resolution. To the resolution, I'm sorry. Item, okay. number, item number seven, which was, I made that resolution and it was just an amendment as to Somebody who so appeared. we should have a vote on it by saying, so we will adopt this if there are no objections, so that you give someone an opportunity to say that if they're against it. Otherwise, you're railroading it. So just say those words. And then also there was another one where you had two extra paragraphs, which sounded like you were introducing that as another option for us to consider. No. I submitted an alternative resolution because an applicant didn't sign stipulations. I sent it out in advance. I moved the whole resolution as an alternative. You can take a vote on it. Okay. I apologize. So if I believe if you it's should an alternative, then we should decide. No, wait. I just need to say, David, I don't think you should mischaracter no, what you're no, I, I, I What mean, I did is railroading. I, I, okay. I appreciate the commentary, and I'm happy to take the suggestion. But you could leave out the other characterizations that okay. I don't care about. I kind of meant to say things like this anyway. People can feel like they are not being welcomed. I appreciate to speak that. Up is what and it I'm really happy meant. to have everyone vote on okay. everything individually okay. if that's necessary. No, you it's could not. Have said that. 
just just make it just offer it as an option and ask if there are any objections and if there are not so there's an alternative resolution offer it as an an as an so option I, to vote on the other thing yeah, is go. just an amendment to add substantive information to my resolution that i add to every single resolution so it's okay, not so then, the character of the resolution so, so these are two amendments and we can just say if there's no objection then they're both adopted and that's okay great. Were there any objections okay. to the right. resolution and the amendment that I made? So the resolution for item number three and the amendment for item number seven. I don't see any hands. Olympia has her hand up. Olympia. Olympia. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. So I wanted to second the the suggestions that Alexandra uh, has suggested, and I think now we can just ask if anybody opposes, and then we're done. So I second all your suggestions. Any opposing? Any oppositions? Okay. Okay. That being said, then we are so moved. Thank you. Okay. Land use. Okay. Um, so um, we discussed the two bridges rezoning application this month, and we approved a letter provided by the co applicants for resubmitting the application. Um, the letter is attached to the vote sheet. I hope everyone had a chance to read it. So I also want to give you some background because um, DCP gave us a very negative response on our rezoning application. Um, back in March, and later, CB3 hired a land use consultant to prepare a um, strategy memos to help us analyze the situation and also uh, make recommendations. So basically, the consultants gave us two options. We can either, one, resubmit the application as is, or number two, um, we can negotiate with the city and the co-applicants chose option number one, which is also in line with CB3's current position. And, um, and this is also what the letter is about. Um, and we also discussed that um, if the application is again um, declined by DCP, then the co-applicants may choose to sue the city. And if that happens, a CB3 would not be part of it because we are also a city agency and um, we cannot sue the city. And that's all I have for the report. Okay, I see a hand up, Troy. Troy, you're on mute. Yes, Alicia, I had, I had a question, um, and it's not about what Jackie just discussed, um, but it goes along with this um, group, I guess. Um, I want to know when uh, the NYCHA and Section 8 meetings are going to start, because there seem to be a lot of problems in NYCHA that we're not discussing here. Uh, Alicia, do you want me to answer that question? Go ahead, Jackie, because we had a, an extended conversation about it. So if you want to break it down, go ahead. Yeah, so Troy, um, thank you so much for um, raising that question. In fact, um, Alicia and I um, had a, a long conversation about that. Um, so we are planning um, to start that conversation, um, uh, to, to have that conversation to reactivate the NYCHA subcommittee, uh, maybe uh, in October. The reason we want to do it in October is because in September, um, the community board has a lot of um, budget consulting uh, meetings that we have to handle. And I um, actually already start uh, planning a um, planning a agenda item for October for Nature as well. Um, and the item would cover um, uh, the recent conversion issue because the city is, um, is um, forming a trust for the conversion and also um, about the um, recovery and resilience issue. Um, and, um, and you'll be um, provide a certain materials before the meeting. I hope I answer your question. Uh, also, Jack, Jackie, I'm sorry. I just want to also just say to Troy and to the members that were actually on that subcommittee, um, you do know that when you're dealing with NYCHA, it takes a long time to get a representative to come out. And many of the issues that you want to discuss around NYCHA, you have to have one of their representatives come out. 
Otherwise we will be just having conversations. We need to get to the bottom to get to the source of the, of the issues. And so the representatives, however many it is, um, it takes quite a while to schedule them to come out because it's at night and they don't get paid, you know, overtime and all of that. So we just need to make sure that we're able to let them know well in advance to come to um, a community board meeting. Thank you. Alicia, Mr. Maris, can I be a put on sack, please? I'm sorry. What'd you say, Damaris? I said, could I be put on stack? I don't know if there are other people before me, so. You're raising your hand? I am. Okay, I'm sorry, because you didn't raise your hand. I Okay, is, is the only way to raise your hand through the, you the wanna see, okay. Yeah, on the, well, on the participants. Okay, so okay. you want me to do that now? No, I, Damaris, go ahead, speak. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm trying to get, I don't, I don't know if I'm supposed to speak or raise my hand, that's all. <laughs> I just wanna um, reiterate, you know, um, choice concerns, there are a lot of issues happening. And, you know, I really want to just um, encourage you all when you have these conversations, not to have them in a vacuum, but to include some of us, whether we have expressed interest or not, reach out to us who know day to day what is happening in NYCHA, um, both as residents and as advocates and as, you know, folks uh, who are, you know, on the ground and talking with NYCHA about a, a, a lot of different issues. Um, and so then I, I'm, I say that to say, do you all have a sense of in October when you try to reconvene these meetings, what the issues are that are going to be put on the agenda? Um, so there are two things um, that we've been planning. The first is to, um, to invite someone from NYCHA um, to talk about the conversion. Um, and that's to convert the, the conversion from um, session nine to session eight to form the chest. So that is one thing that um, we are planning. And the second thing we've been thinking about is that um, is the recovery and resilience. I think we want to know if there's any update on the backup generator um, inst installation. And that's the two things in my mind. But of course, you are more than welcome to provide further input if you have any other thoughts. Well, I'm sure you all know I have many things all the time. Yes. <laughs> it would be possible to know who is being appointed to that committee and who the new chair is going to be? I think that is the conversation we're going to have in October. So you're going to preside over the meeting, Jackie? Is that what's going to... Is um, it going to be a NYCHA meeting and we're going to talk about the NYCHA stuff? Or is it going to be a NYCHA subcommittee meeting and then we're going to talk about where the committee is going from there? So, um, so I think um, in October, we're gonna have a conversation um, how to reactivate the NYCHA subcommittee. However, I understand there are certain NYCHA issues we want to discuss now, so as soon as possible. So we are putting the NYCHA issues on the land use committee for October. But going forward after October, we will try to, we will reactivate the NYCHA subcommittee and the future topics would be okay. uh, conducted at the NYCHA subcommittee. And of course, um, there would be um, a new chair appointed um, by Alicia. Okay, thanks for the clarity. Okay, Olympia. Hey, so my question is also a little bit about clarity. Uh, now with the questions, I understood what we're discussing, but if there are concerns by Troy Demaris that there is urgency, uh, then maybe we should move it into September because we know how the administration works. So this is just, you know, uh, I know we like to give them ahead of time, et cetera, but I think land use could definitely handle September if there are urgent issues because we know that right now they're using the pandemic as a way to further exploit the neediest people. So if there is urgency, I you know, I'm happy for us to have a longer meeting and address it in September, Jackie. It's not about having a longer meeting, Olympia. It's just like um, 
Alicia mentioned a little bit earlier, we um, need to have a nature representative to provide the answers. And nature's representative usually take quite a bit of time to make appointment with, with them because we are doing this after hours. So, and we are already coming to the end of October. So having, we, we are not, com I, I'm not sure if we can get them um, for the September meeting. Damaris? You've got two other hands up. Yeah, I see, I see that. Damaris, go ahead and then Valentina. I was just, um, I don't necessarily agree that it takes the NYCHA reps as long. However, I don't know that we have to have a meeting in September because many of us are not, I think, prepared for those discussions, perhaps. You know, as everybody, the, the summer is coming to an end. I just really want to make sure that we don't go beyond October. And that whether we have a NYCHA rep or not at the October meeting, we at least carve out the time to set up what are the issues that we want to be covering with this committee so that we have a plan moving forward. Yeah, I, I think the most and, does and just one last point. thing, Jackie, if I could say one thing, one just last thing about the NYCHA Preservation Trust and the Blueprint for Change, none of that is happening yet until there is legislation that is passed at the federal level. So right now, those are just plans. Those that's that's all they are are plans until they can get legislative um, approval to do what it is that they want to do. So just you know, in terms of the sense of urgency, it's not that it's not important, you know, but so is the relief efforts and everything that have been happening and the conditions in the developments right now. Those are all real things I think that need to be talked about and you know. Thank you, Olympia, for saying September, but I don't know that we'll be ready anyway. Thank you, Demaris. That's the reason um, we want to do it on, in October, because we want to gather um, more information. At the same time, um, we want to reach out to more people like you and also Choi um, and, and, and other um, uh, nature um, uh, tenants who may be on the board to see what is the the, the, uh, the um, topic we want to discuss. So that's why we are doing it in October. But thank you, uh, Demaris. Valentina. Yeah, I think that one of the things to do, if if you're planning to meet it, even say for October, is to contact Ryan Honan's office and and tell them what it is that you are thinking about, so that they can have that person prepared. Because it's very easy to say no if somebody calls you up two days in advance, but it's very difficult when you give people adequate notice and tell them exactly what it is that you want. Uh, to talk about and what you want someone there for. It is very difficult for them to say no when you give them adequate notice and you state what it is you want them to talk about. I've dealt with them otherwise and, you know, I generally gave them three dates and said pick one and they picked one. And, you know, I, I have to say it generally has been through Brian Honan's office and then they get whoever uh, is the person to do that. So I think that you need to like get on top of this and be kind of efficient about it because, you know, that's how they are. Thank you, Valentina. Thank, thank you, Val. Okay, Jackie. Um, any, anyone have any comments about the letter or any questions for Jackie other than the NYCHA Section 8 subcommittee? Okay, I guess not. Jackie, thank you. Thank you. Okay, transportation, Paul. Uh, good evening. Um, so transport I know transportation item number two was brought up earlier by the community, uh, two members of the public. Um, we did postpone that item indefinitely uh, until they're ready to come back on a future agenda. So I guess the people from the community that came out tonight um, when that comes back on, I guess that will be the time to come back and say those same things in support of the uh, pedestrian plaza. Um, other than that, we postponed the item indefinitely. We did district needs, and that's it. Thank you, Paul. Any questions for Paul? 
All right, thank you. Economic development, Anisha? Um, we don't have any items for tonight. We worked on the district needs at our meeting this month. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Parks? Trevor? Good evening, everyone. Uh, being last on committee reports means I'm gonna make this short. Uh, we did pass one resolution in addition to updating everyone on ESCR. There is a community advisory group uh, which has been meeting, it's been meeting twice, and they are taking votes as to whether to make a public meeting or to keep it uh, in its current format. I think that most people are gonna vote to make it a public meeting. Uh, but that is not a committee or organization formed by Community Board 3. Um, it was at the direction of public officials and is now run by the Pratt uh, Institute. So just for that information, a lot of folks think that we organize it or it's a CB3 group and it's not. We're just a member, uh, one of many members on that group. I think about 50, uh, supposed to be about 15, but it has ballooned into a very large group. Um, the resolution that we're looking at is that for uh, Pier 35, which has seen a number of problems uh, over the last few months. Um, so we were looking for some creative solutions to try to control uh, what we've been seeing. Uh, I don't know if anyone else is experiencing fireworks at night, uh, but Pier 35 still has hours of uh, fireworks, including this past weekend. Uh, and uh, it's amazing that we still have these issues, but that's the way things are. Uh, there are uh, some suggest suggested corrections that I'd like to offer, and I don't want to get yelled at, so I'm gonna try and do this the proper way. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of errors that were made that I did not catch. In the first, if you go down to, I don't know what page it is, uh, the first bullet point of the whereas, where it says, New York City Parks and NYPD should close the Pier 36 Park at midnight. It should read the Pier 35 Park at midnight. Uh, I've gotten some comments and some follow-up that folks want the, parks to, the park to actually close at 11 p.m. as opposed to midnight because parks uh, standard closures are 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. I thought that 12 a.m. would sort of be uh, you know, a way for people to still enjoy uh, the park until it gets pretty late. But the, this past weekend's attendance of about 400 people and a DJ party and fireworks for hours made folks <laughs> send messages saying it needs to close at 11. So that's a change I would like to offer for uh, that particular bullet point. Uh, and David helped me if I'm doing this wrong, but do I have any, are there any objections to those two uh, changes? Trevor, it looks like um, there might be two instances where it says Pier 36. I've got them all. The second to last whereas says so Pier 36 also. There's a whereas? Yeah. The second to last whereas says so Pier 36 has similar issues as- Yeah, other. that that's that's correct, actually, because the piers are next to each other and this was to cover both piers. Oh, okay, sorry. And to that point, there's another bullet point that we're gonna, uh, that was offered uh, and that needed some corrections. And that is the one, two, three, four, seventh bullet point down where it says EDC and Doc New York City should secure the adjacent Pier 36 area with a full-time dock master, dock master and security. Uh, what we did not add and I would like to add uh, is it should now read EDC and Doc New York City should secure and immediately repair the camera system at the adjacent Pier 36 area, and also add a full-time dock master with security. Are there any objections to that, uh, uh, those changes? Okay, I'm gonna assume that those are accepted. Uh, just an update for the next meeting. Uh, we will continue to discuss ESCR uh, for this month. It will. Uh, we'll talk about open space mitigations. Uh, parks have promised a number of open space mitigations before the pandemic, uh, including free ferry rides to Governor's Island, um, open streets, uh, and some other uh, things. But we don't know where they are. What, 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 we don't know exactly what Parks is going to do about that. So we're going to discuss that 
also for the BMCR, which is the Brooklyn Montgomery Coastal Resiliency Area. Uh, they're going to come back to us with a full design for that particular plan. And additionally, we're going to discuss the Lower East Side Ecology Center uh, and get a full update on the city and parks plan for uh, the Ecology Center and the Accomplish Yard. Questions? I see Paul has a question. Yeah, just, just a point of clarity. Um, you're looking to get both the NYPD to step up their patrols and a private security uh, to, to be a part of this? Where is this? What are you talking about? Where well, are you? In the bullet points, I'm looking at the Parks, Parks Patrol and uh, NYPD to make a commitment mm -hmm. to patrol. So you're yes. looking for them to step up their patrols or they haven't been patrolling at all? Well, there's, this is an issue we discussed. Unfortunately, PEP only has two officers to patrol the entire area and they get off their shift at 4 p.m. Most of the issues have happen after uh, 7 p.m. So about four o'clock in the morning. So Parks is saying they don't have the staff. NYPD is claiming that it is a park and that Parks should do something about the fact that they're having problems at their park. So we're asking for them both to step up patrols. To be fair, we've talked about this and they've actually increased their patrols PEP has also extended their staff to 10 p.m. on weeknights just for this particular area. Okay, and you're in the next bullet point, you're looking for them to, to bring in private security as well? No, Doc New York City controls Pier 36, which is right next to Pier 35. Okay. That's they're hired by EDC. They are supposed to provide a dock master for that area. They have not provided a dock master for that area. Um, last year they had one. This year, because no one's been paying attention, there just hasn't been a dock master. There have been at least three bodies found floating off the pier and a number of jumpers because the gates are open because the boats come in. So they just, you know, they have a little drink and they think they can swim. So they jump off into the pier. We didn't have that problem last year. So we're asking for the dock master to return and for them to provide security. So we're asking Dock New York City, which controls the pier, at least through EDC to provide security. Great, thanks. Any other questions? All other questions are keeping us from ending this meeting, so. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I don't see any hands, Trevor. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I guess, uh, I, I, Michelle, you caught all those uh, amendments that, okay, and no one opposed any of the amendments that were made, okay. All right, great. Um, so, hmm, I think that concludes. Oh my goodness. Okay. Now we'll have a roll call vote. Okay, thanks, Alicia. Um, David Adams. Yes. Your own Altman. Yes. Jesse Beck. Jesse Beck. You're on mute, Jesse. There you go. Oh, now you're on again. Yes. Thank you. Dominic Berg. Yes. Lee Berman. Yes. Carlin Chan. Yes. Jonathan Chu. Yes. David Crane. Yes. Felicia Crookshank. Yes. Eric Diaz. Yes. Alistair Economakis. Yes. Shirley Fennessy. Yes. Ryan Gillum. Not on. Thanks. Deborah Glass. Yes. Andrea Gordillo. Yes. Herman Hewitt. Herman Hewitt. Yes. Thank you. Trevor Holland. Yes. Linda Jones. Yes. Valentina Jones. Yes. Tatiana Jorio. Yes. Lisa Kaplan. Yes. Olympia Kazi. Yes. Joseph Kearns. Oh. Michelle Cooper Smith. Yes. May Lee. Yes. Wendy Lee. Not on. Oh, yeah. 
Alicia Lewis Coleman. Yes, on every item except SLA. No, A SLA item number three. You want to vote no on the new resolution? Yes, I don't want to vote for them at all. No, okay. I don't care if they have stipulations or not. Well, we adopted a resolution that has no stipulations, right, Alex? Yeah. Yes. The oh. oh, we're voting to deny. Yeah, okay. So then, yes. Okay. Thank you. David Louie. Yes. Ellen Liu. Yes. Michael Marino. Yes. Alexandra Molitano. Yes. Michael Perlis. It's not on. Okay, thanks. Tariq Ramos. Tariq, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Yes. Thank you. Paul Rangel. Yes. Carolyn Ratcliffe. Yes. Damaris Reyes. Um, yes, um, on, on all except for land use, two, the two bridges uh, letter, I'm present not voting because there's a conflict. And I abstain on the parks uh, resolution regarding the peers. Okay, that's number eight. And what's your uh, conflict for land use? That um, we are co-applicants. Okay, thank Michelle, you. So I need to update my vote also. Oh, okay. For the same land use item, I need to present non-voting conflict. Well, I'm a also co-applicant. Thank you, Damaris, for pointing it out. No problem. <laughs> okay. Thanks for clarifying. Um, okay, Richard Robiak. Yes. Thomas Rosa. Yes. Robin Chattel. Yes. Heidi Schmidt. Larissa Scheinberg. Yes. Clint Smeltzer. Yes. Anisha Stephen. Yes. Sandra Strother. Not on. Okay, thank you. Josephine mm -hmm. Velez. Yes. Troy Velez. Yes. Rodney Washington. Not on. Thank you. Kathleen Webster. Yes. Jackie Wong. Yes. Ricky Wong. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Michelle, actually, Alicia, one more thing. Michelle, I don't know if you saw, uh, you probably didn't in the chat. Carlin, I don't remember if he spoke or not, but he said yes in the chat. So he may have been having problems with his audio. Okay. Yeah, I got him. Thank you, Carlin. Okay, okay, good. Okay. All right, everyone. Uh, that concludes our full board meeting. Um, I don't think we adjourn. Oh. Uh, Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Michael second. I Good saw night, that everybody. physical hand. Um, see you all September 22nd. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.